What's up, everyone, and welcome back to Our Small Majority. My name's Christian Black. And I'm Matthew Gorichkovsky. And today we are revisiting Dr. Christina Eubin. Now, Christina Eubin was actually interviewed last season. She's um, a researcher at UCI um, that studies FASD. Now, what exactly is FASD? That's a good question. FASD stands for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and it could not only include alcohol, but any sort of substance when it comes to um, cigarettes, marijuana, um, crack cocaine, anything, you name it. Um, and it, and what happens is if it's introduced to anyone who's pregnant, um, the fetus ends up being affected in the end and there's all sorts of complications, unfortunately. So what Christina does is she dedicates her research in advocating for equal rights for people that are affected by these alterations. Um, so it, we had such a great time talking with her last season mm -hmm. instead of our episode, Teratogens of Our Nation. And we're super excited to introduce her back along with her husband, Justin. And the reason Dr. Ubin is joining us today for a second time is because her and her husband, Justin Shepard, are making a film together about FASD. Justin has been a stand-up comedian for 20 years. He's been a voiceover actor. And now he's directing this film with his wife, Dr. Eubin. So he's traveled, so far he's traveled around the United States, conducting 40 interviews in two weeks uh, in a RV dubbed The Rust Bucket uh, with his brother, Jeff. And which I feel like 40 interviews in two weeks is mind blowing. That's three interviews, pretty much three interviews per day. Uh, so they, they've definitely had a lot of work ahead of them. We've been collaborating with them recently, uh, helping them edit their first video that they'll be posting sometime soon, we hope. Um, I believe it's already finished, so maybe by the time this episode is out, you'll already have seen the video. Yeah, we're super excited when it comes to this film, and we've even helped collaborate with it as well as our small majority. Um, we've provided different services when it comes to just helping out with graphics, getting the word out, um, looking at different cuts and giving advice, whatever that we could do in order to make sure that this awesome project moves forward. Um, and we just can't wait to see the finished product. But for now, we wanted to tell all you, you guys about it um, and even hear your thoughts on it afterwards, too. If you haven't already, don't forget to watch a season one interview with Dr. Eubin titled The Teratogens of Our Nation with Dr. Christina Eubin. Uh, we talk, we go into really into depth about FASD, and we don't want you to miss out on anything because that information is really important to know, especially if you're planning on having a kid ever. So go do that. And also follow us on whatever listening platform you're listening to right now so that you can get notifications right when we upload an episode. Now on with the interview. <laughs> Thanks again, um, Christina, for joining us for the second time. Uh, we had such a good talk um, about FASD uh, and just the work that you do um, at UCI. And then, Justin, thank you for joining us for the first time. Um, now we get a new perspective on FASD, uh, not only at a scientific um, point of view, but also um, filmmaking and actually telling the story and making an environment for people to learn about it that may not have this background or may not have this knowledge at their disposal. Um, but before we start, um, I just wanted to ask again permission just to record you guys um, and then also any sort of trailers or plugins or anything like that that you would want us to advertise on the show, we would love to do it um, with your permission, of course. Of yes. course, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Go right ahead. And you got that clip from us, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. So awesome. Um, so yeah, me. we'll get right into the nitty gritty. Um, so before we even um, jump into this awesome, awesome film that's in, under development, um, how about you both in your own perspective, both the researcher and um, the expert inside the entertainment field, um, what is FASD? 
Uh, we wanted to get your perspective on what that means to you and what you've learned about it throughout the years. Um, and then first, just to recap, Christina, and um, an introduction for you, Justin. Um, who are you guys? Um, so you're a couple. Um, you've done all sorts of work individually and together. Um, but how about you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, so... Uh... I'm Christina Eubin. I'm an assistant professor of public health, and I'm a developmental neuroscientist by training. Um, so I do neuro a neuroimaging of kids, um, typically developing kids, kids with prenatal substance exposure, and I look at outcomes like uh, cognition, how how well they navigate school, social contacts, and and you know just their ability to thrive. Um, in life as a function of their prenatal exposures. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, I'm Justin Shepard. I've been, um, I started off, um, as a stand-up comedian. I still do it. Well, once the pandemic's over anyway, and we're able to be in crowds again. Um, and, uh, moved my way towards, um, I got my degree in, um, uh, theater with concentrations on writing, directing, and acting, um, and then moved to LA and pursued a career in acting and uh, production, and have uh, am on my second smaller production company uh, called Make It Better Productions, that is currently working to uh, get the word out on awareness for FASD. So my knowledge um, on the on the subject dates back to when I first met Christina about 15 years ago and she told me you know what it was she was going to do her dissertation on um, in University of British Columbia and um, you know I hadn't really ever really heard of it so um, of this this as it's why it's referred to as the invisible disorder or the unseen disorder um, you know um, it's it's got a high prevalence but you know um, just a lot of people don't know about it and I think that that's um, something that we're aiming to try and overcome is uh getting the word out on it and i think it will take a lot of work <laughs> from a lot of people to hit that critical mass um, mm -hmm. of knowledge so um but yeah i've learned a lot from christina and her um you know i've gotten to sit on the sidelines and, and watch as she you know walks into the room and tells me some incredible statistic related to fasd and such and Eventually, you know, um, she's been working with a group called FASD Communities, and they reached out to her and um, were looking for help to facilitate a, an awareness movement for this. And uh, wow. here we are now trying to make this film. So. so, Christian, it's really funny that you asked us what is FASD, which we should probably answer that, too, yeah. um, because that's actually, I think, how you, Justin, opened up all your interviews for the film yes. is using that question. So it's, 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 that's really um yeah. And it's, I mean, it's of course the, um, um, I think the, the reason that I'm really happy to be, um, a part of this project and, um, able to, um, give my version of this story and try and help translate for the lay person. Um, I think that that's where a lot of science, um, nowadays has trouble getting through to, um, the, the community at large, um, mm -hmm just the lay person, right? It's like synthesizing that information to something understandable um, and that we can grasp onto. So um, yeah, that is how I, I interviewed almost 40 people. Um, and that was the opening question. Um, and oftentimes people would take a deep breath and then talk for the better part of an hour wow. <laughs> before I get my second question in, uh, because it's a very loaded question what it is. It's, um, it stands for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, it is a, a large encompassing um, spectrum um, and it can look like many things. Um, it started out with our knowledge of, of course, um, FAS, which is just fetal um, alcohol syndrome. Um, and that we just had our, what, 50 year um, anniversary? Not yet. And yeah. Okay. This year. Yeah. Of the first publication of it, but yeah, but I mean, you got to think for that's how long we've known about it and it's still becoming more and more a problem. Um, you know, um, drinking and prenatal alcohol exposure. So basically, you know, it's uh, when a fetus is exposed to alcohol in the womb and then um, suffers brain damage from that. And then there's a, um, a litany of other 
um, health issues and um, mental health disorders that come along with that brain damage. And it is uh, a, considered a lifelong sentence um, for that fetus. So we're trying to get the word out um, that uh, mm -hmm. give these um, unborn babies a voice because um, they can't defend themselves or speak for themselves. And so, um, you know, um, and it's not anything that anybody asks for, of course, um, uh, to, get, to have an FASD. My scientific definition of FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, is a spectrum, it's an umbrella term that refers to a, a grouping of diagnoses that all are represent a pervasive developmental disability that was uh, resulted by prenatal alcohol exposure. So this is a pervasive, lifelong developmental disability um, that is preventable, unlike autism or Down syndrome. And uh, it's related to... Um, all sorts of different factors, but ultimately these uh, individuals who are exposed don't have the optimal version of their neurophysiology that they would have mm -hmm. otherwise had to live their life. So, and then it shows up differently depending on the developmental stage at which you look at them. So, um, yeah. Wow. And well, of course, this is like a very, very prevalent issue and it, it can even get heavy at some point too. Mm -hmm. um, so, Going back to, to what you stated earlier, trying to synthesize a message to people for them to all understand this condition or the spectrum. Um, Justin, with your experience as a comedian, um, how do you sort of maybe work in humor throughout the film or maybe even work in a way to sort of ease the tension for your interviewees? Um, because I can sort of see both perspectives. I, I work with Christina inside of her lab, so we can go back and forth with, you know, scientific jargon and things like that. And, oh, we need to look into this next and, you know, things like that. But when I talk to Matthew, for instance, um, his background, um, is inside, um, educational science and we both have a background in filmmaking. Um, so whenever I'm trying to tell him something that me and Christina discussed over, <laughs> he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you sort of first, um, digest all of that information, um, when it comes to maybe a lot of terminology or specifics, um, when it comes to this subject? And then how do you relay that back to people and say, yeah, I did my job. I was able to um get my point across well i think for me uh it's you know th just to kind of go back to something you just previously stated it can get very heavy and mm -hmm. you know this was um this journey that we went on to this filmmaking just me and my brother we traveled across you know nine different cities and five thousand miles in two weeks and interviewed 40 people and 44 I, 40, 43 okay yeah, yeah yeah 40 plus people and um i you know um i gotta say it was probably the most emotional i mean one of the most emotional journeys i've ever been on in my entire life and and it is very heavy um subject matter and it I think the thing that um, we're trying to put out on display is that um, this isn't, you know, when you remove the science, there's there's people out there living with this. There's caretakers and caregivers that are stretched to the max. Um, there's people in prison that shouldn't be in prison. There's, I mean, it. There's there's so much to this that is so. Um, I, I guess I would say I'm trying to uncover the pathos of this, right? Pull on the heartstrings of people and understand, remove that layer of science, even though it's such an important um, aspect because it gives us the numbers for us to wrap our heads around, right? But for me, um, I'm, I'm able to hear people's stories. And that's, you know, when I asked that question, just as you did, what is FASD? I mean, you, you know, you really could. I mean, people did talk for a long time about what it is because it's different to every single person. And, um, you know, um, I think that at times when it did get heavy, sometimes in the interviews, you know, we'd, we'd make jokes or, you know, like I, you know, someone would talk for, um, you know, let's say 35, 40 minutes on that first question. And then some, we'd have to hold for sound and I would, you know, jokingly say, okay, let's just take it back from the top. Um, what is FASD? You know, and we'd laugh and kind of like joke about, cause it's just, such a heavy topic and there's so much information to it. So what we're trying to do is, you know, um, take the um, talking points that would 
someone that doesn't has never heard the term FASD, which is a lot of people, right? A lot of people have never heard the acronym. They don't know what it stands for. I was testing it out while we were out on the road. I, I ran into a conversation with a gentleman at a gas station. And he's like, oh, you know, what are you, what are you doing pulling the trailer around? And I was like, well, we're making a film. And he's, you know, asked about what. And I said about FASD. And he was like, oh, yeah. Well, he clearly had no idea, right? But I mean, just, that, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, we're trying to get the common person, the average person who's never heard of this to know what it stands for, to know what it means. And, you know, one of the first things Sarah Maselt said at um, um, Proof Alliance, she's the executive director of Proof Alliance in Minnesota, um, was that this impacts us all. We all know someone. And this was a through line for everybody. We, it, you know, at one in 20 people, those are the numbers that we know, right? So that with no diagnostic systems that are really solid, um, the numbers are probably much higher, you know? And so we all know someone, we're all impacted by this, whether or not you know it or not, you know? Um, so we're trying to get that message out and get people talking about it. And the best way to do it is just streamline down all of the jargon to the most basic stuff, which is this, this is brain damage to a fetus. Okay. This is what it is. And this is what people are living with. And we can prevent this by removing drinking from pregnancy. But it's going to take all of us. It's not just on the mothers. Mm -hmm. It's on all of us. And so, um, you know, like I said, it's been quite a transformation for me, even since I've gotten back. Like, it is a lot to digest. It's a right. lot to, you know, try and, and synthesize. And at times I feel overwhelmed because I have this board up as I'm making this film of presentation of information and where I'm going to go from here to there and statistics. And there's just so much, right. That we're actually aiming for a docu-series because it'd be impossible to cover the entirety of FASD in one film. So, and that's something I realized early on that we need to make a streamlined informational awareness video that will double as a pilot that we will pitch to get money for, to make a docu-series because it is a global issue. Uh, it is an economic issue. It is a, you know, prison industrial complex issue it's um it's not it, it it is an ses issue in the fact that we're, the way that we're viewing it so and have been economic it. status yeah sorry yeah, so yeah. you know um issue so um so there's there's so many parts moving parts to it um that we're we're hoping to just find the best way to present information that um, people at a college level and even and even younger kids can understand i mean i think that that's the real overarching maybe solution that we're heading towards the youth you know what i mean it's this is kind of their like many problems global climate and every other thing it's it's this is their problem you know um so all we can do is try and set them up best to solve these problems so and i think that that's taking a look at our greater relationship with alcohol so can i uh, i comment on that too i mean the the interesting thing is like you know you are a comedian and there is no real place for comedic insertion there is a lot of you know joyful laughter and shared connection with people through this experience mm -hmm. but the actual topic itself i mean there literally is absolutely nothing comedic about it at all i mean mm -hmm. you, these these you know parents don't want that for their kid but you know when you have this abstract phenomena of this baby that that may not even be planned or necessarily wanted, you know, at, at that moment, you know, I mean, the idea that what you're doing is impacting that baby's, you know, future brain is just not even something that's even a thought that enters people's brains. And then we think it's all on mom. When in fact, if you're hanging out with someone who's pregnant, do not drink, do not do anything unhealthy for the baby. That's how you support that baby's health outcome. In that moment, when you're hanging out with a coworker, sister, friend, partner, and yeah, like if you're, if you're the partner, you know, that would mean quite a long period of no use to support that mom. I mean, it's not all about the mom. And then this goes back to a much bigger awareness movement of, you know, this is very much grassroots movement. This is uh, all the major organizations in the United States. So no fast. Um, this is Jen uh, Wisdall with no fast uh, Washington. This is Marissa Ling and Sarah Maselt with Proof Alliance in Minnesota this is, you know, we, um, a lot of people together, uh, coming together with FASD communities, a non-for-profit residential housing, just for young women, uh, young people with an FASD. I mean, this is a grassroots movement together. So this is much bigger than even just a standalone film. Yeah. 
And I can say for sure that I definitely, I cried more than I laughed, you know, mm -hmm. on, and uh, during this journey, I cried with the families. I cried, um, when I was able to in interview um, some of the girls at the, at, that live at the, ha the Platteville house, the only one of its kind in our country, the only one, and four people live there. Um, and we're trying to get hundreds, if, if not thousands of more of these houses in place. Um, I cried um, at how powerful and how resilient and how amazing this community is. And um, I felt their pain and I felt um, you know, their frustrations with how things have gone and how they've been overlooked. And, um, you know, and that's what I'm trying to capture and put on display in this film. So, um, cause I think that, you know, we're approaching, they're getting ready to, uh, reintroduce another, um, article of legislation, um, mm -hmm. that they've been trying for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Marissa said, Marissa Lang, a proof of alliance said, as long as she's been there, they've never gotten it through. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been introduced every single year. Um, and you got to think of the frustrations of the lack of resources for families and those individuals that are affected by an FASD. Um, how just, you know, disheartening that is, you know, um, and that comes into play with a lot of factors are, you know, I think it's our societal, again, view and relationship with alcohol. Um, the alcohol lobby and their, their, you know, quiet movement within, uh, politics. And, um, you know, like I said, it's, and also too, it's just, it's a matter of, uh, as I interviewed, you know, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, someone whom I sent a clip, um, he, he was probably my favorite interview just because he was able to step back and give bigger pictures and talk in broader strokes, um, which was something that I was really needing from an interviewee and not pinpointing in the exact science of all of this, but really just broader strokes. And he, he talked about pain, you know, and our, our relationship with pain and why do we drink and why, you know what I mean? And it's, it's a, it's a rite of passage. It's a part of our culture. It's very, it's just built in. So eventually we're going to have to uh, take a look at that. I think everybody is going to have to, it certainly, you know, has, you know, made me think of it and um and and those around me that i've talked to about it it's you know it's it raises a very uh, interesting talking point um which is just you know alcohol in general in the u.s so um but i you know as i can say it was just a very oops, sorry um a very emotional journey and um and we're still on it <laughs> You know, we're still rewatching the footage and sifting through and, and trying to, um, again, like I said, synthesize and digest that information so that we can give it to the public. Some of the comedy is that they were in a trailer. It was Justin and his brother, which are large grown men sharing a bed. <laughs> and then they busted the back of the trailer off at one stop. Mm -hmm. And I had booked them some reservation at some RV park one night when they were stuck. And literally the front page of the online website for this RV park was just like a creepy murderous glove <laughs> in the dark. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty creepy. Anyway, so that, you know, kind of that part was... <laughs> brought some needed relief probably yeah we didn't have a radio for the first probably 30 hours of travel um mm -hmm. and then we finally got a radio in and that was a pretty joyous moment um and uh <laughs> god <laughs> you know, just I mean, it for 30 I mean, hours <laughs> you know i mean you guys have a film background like you can imagine <laughs> some of my other friends that work in film and production as I told them that two of us that are inexperienced, I'm not a DP at all, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is director of photography for any listeners that don't know what that is, but uh, it's, you know, someone who knows their way around a camera on, and all cameras. And so I had to buy a camera that would do most of the work for me. So thankfully I did. My brother had never done anything production related. He did a great job on sound. Like luckily he's very technically proficient and um you know, we, we figured out the lighting and the shots together and all that stuff and just did everything just the two of us. We loaded everything in and out and set everything up and, you know, did the interviews, just the two of us and, you know, um, managed to not get or give COVID-19 to anybody, which was yeah. really our greatest achievement through that whole trip. So, well, um, if you need anybody to help you, we, uh, we got you, we have a, we have our own DP, uh, <laughs> so we'd be we'd be very happy to uh, help with your doc if you ever need it. 
Yes, we would love to have you guys on. We would love yeah. you for help. Yes, we are looking for help in every corner that we can. And as Christina mentioned before, you know, this is all grassroots. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's no big anybody behind this that's got right. dollar amounts pushing it. This is all families and friends that are raising yeah. money. Um, and by the way, before I forget, because I know I will, um, at the FASDproject.org, uh, there's a link to a GoFundMe. Um, it's, um, this is all nonprofit, um, through Ta FASD tax community. deduction, you'll get a tax yep. receipt. Yeah. And so, um, you can go on there and you can kind of keep track of our progress and what we're doing and where we're at with it. And, um, so, um, you know, any and all help is appreciated, whether it's mm -hmm. donated time or money or whatever people have, uh, to help. So we would love your guys' help. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Right. We'll let everybody know. Yeah. I wanted, I, I, I wanted to go back. You were talking about how, like, about comedy in, in this and not you know like this this whole you know this is very uh emotional but i feel like in order to be a good comedian you have to also be able to empathize right mm -hmm. and i mean good comedian not uh, bad comedians are different <laughs> good, comedians, <laughs> good comedians i'd say like like someone like dave Chappelle, right mm -hmm. they know how to yeah, empathize yeah. with their yeah. audience they know what they're going through mm -hmm. and they're able to turn that pain into something to reflect on right 100%. so I, I, so I, I think i think comedy does have a role in this even even though nothing is funny about it i think that that empathy aspect that you learn through comedy definitely comes into it because well yeah. i think that's that's the translation i think you nailed that on the head it's you know um it you take that empathy and you just put your own perspective every every comedian naturally has built in what i call a skewed perspective right and a lot of uh comedians realize this early on in life when they say something that they don't realize is funny they're just saying something from their perspective and people say oh that's hilarious right and you're like oh mm -hmm. is it okay so i didn't even that's just my perspective right so um your take what you're doing is you're taking your empathy and translating that into with your own perspective something that's humorous and that is relatable right so yeah um you know and i i i did i i think that is one of my strong suits as um an interviewer i guess is you know i mean it like i said it got emotional a lot i was you know we were sitting there shedding tears a lot and like i couldn't everybody that i was able to interview i couldn't thank them enough for sharing their story and um you know sharing you know, opening up their hearts and laying themselves, just splaying themselves out there, mm -hmm. you know, um, which, and kind of reliving stuff that's very difficult for them. And, um, you know, uh, it was really very powerful. And I, I felt like there was this kind of magic that was, or some sort of something that was like looking over all of this whole thing as we were traveling and uh, things just kept going right when they, you know, could have gone wrong. And minus um, the back of the trailer, Be which was who cares? I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody got hurt, you know, what I'm saying? Like, besides the trailer, besides the rust bucket. So, and we just jumped to action. And luckily, again, another moment of magic for some reason, I decided to grab my tools. You know, why? I, why would I need tools on the road to, to film? Well, because I was, I didn't know it, but I was going to rip the back of my trailer off. And thank goodness I had them wow. because we were able to take the screws and right there on the roadside, splice the wires to the taillights and get back on the road and make it to Philadelphia. Yeah. So, um, and can I, the, the, com the comedy thing too, is, you know, the little bit that we know also about the comics brain that seems to be different is really the way that they look at things that are associated or connected together. And I think, you know, really, if we had done this in Hollywood pre pandemic and tried to fly people in that have an FASD themselves or caregivers that aren't normally in front of a camera and put them in front of a studio or a big crew and, and go for entertainment value. I mean, it would have been a completely disastrous and it would have been possibly harmful. So having a comedian go in there who like Justin knew enough being married to me, but you know, he's, you know, not in the lab every day thinking about FASD. So he was still able to be connected to the viewers point of view who are just getting on board with what FASD is and why it's relevant to them. And then asking these questions that empathy was key, but also the associations. I am, you know, as a scientist, we get kind of indoctrined into a certain kind of language. And I think drawing parallels with, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, 
the words you choose to use are powerful. And so if you call them, you know, good old boys versus homegrown, you know, white supremacist terrorists, that matters. Those are the same people, but your words matter. And I'm just now realizing with FASD, you know, we use words like toxin. Well, guess what? Like Justin went and did interviews and realized, well, actually poison is probably a better word. Like alcohol is a poison to the fetus. It's also a poison to our adult bodies with liver having to metabolize it. And we are able to metabolize it, but we dress it up with like toxin, right? Or, you know, the certain words that we use, like, oh, it it causes harm to the developing fetus. Well, it causes permanent brain damage, right? Like just those little changes in words matter. And it really is, is, has really influenced the way I'm even looking at my own research program. And I think it's that comedic brain of being able to draw these associations. Well, the tobacco industry like no longer can advertise or have smoking and TV shows for kids. Why are, is this still going on with alcohol? Right? Like just drawing those associations, those connections is something that Justin, you were able to do really successfully that I don't know that just any director walking into the situation would have been able to do. Yeah. I think I, I'm, I was, I'd say I was fortunate enough to have a baseline amount of information to really evoke great conversation. That's the one thing that, that really came about. I didn't know how the interview process was going to go. I didn't even know most of these, you know, I had never met them until they walked in the room and sat down for, to be interviewed. And, um, you know, to be able to have an organic conversation was something I was really trying to capture because, again, it gets the professionals away from the language, and then you're talking about the subject matter. It gets um, those that were living with an FASD comfortable enough to talk about, you know, in a feel like they were in a safe space. So I, it's just again, it's something that I think that I'm aiming to try and translate for our viewers. That's the, I'm, I'm in a perfect spot for that. I, I feel like, and, um, I'm just think I'm, I have humility and thankfulness and gratitude towards, uh, being able to be a part of this project. So, um, I'm, you know, we're continuously pressing forward and trying to, uh, uh, get this first video out and we're making mm-hmm. a PSA right now currently. And, um, and so those are some things that we're, we're working on right now. And, uh, and we yeah. should probably mention that um, it was all the parents. It was, you know, individuals with an FASD, the parents that, you know, obviously make this issue extraordinarily important, the relationship our society has with alcohol. But then the pandemic came. Mm-hmm. And then we started getting some data that drinking among, among moms is up 41%. You know, like we don't have to drive anywhere. We're not going anywhere. (laughs) I mean, you know, people are just drinking way more than they were pre-pandemic. And it's kind of like this unchecked drinking. And we just were like, oh my gosh, there's like a huge future epidemic of FASD. So now we already had FASD as a major problem in our globe, not just our society. Although this is just kind of focused on the U.S. at the moment. Um, But it, but we're like facing after COVID kind of gets under control, we're facing this huge onslaught of, you know, kids that are going to be the next sibling, right? Coming in an accidental kind of early brain damage. Cause a lot of that brain damage happens before moms even really know that they're pregnant. People don't realize how those little dividing cells are so vulnerable to that early alcohol exposure before mom yet knows she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's horrifying. It's like this total inconvenient truth. Mm -hmm. So um, that statistic really woke. I I remember Justin just like got woken up one night and he's like, well, we have our RV already. Uh, I could probably get my brother to come and the two of us could do this. And I'm like, yeah, I could probably manage the kids for a couple weeks. And it just was like, we could probably just, do this without fundraising at the moment and just fundraise for the post-production right well going back on like even referring to the clip that you guys sent earlier and um i realized that you also made mention of it too how fasd isn't just its own problem but it's a direct relation to different issues that we have today like the prison industrial system um or maybe um you know not having the proper economy or the proper funds during the pandemic and things like that. So how is FASD related to systemic racism? Mm -hmm. Well, so I I don't, do you want to take that? Sure. Okay. Um, 
the clip that I sent you um, with mm-hmm. Dr. Norris, he really says it best. Um, and I, I actually am not positive because he said so much good stuff, mm-hmm. good stuff in relation to this. Um, I got to um, interview Dr. Radhika Chamada, um, who worked with Carl Bell. Um, and he did a, uh, a study on the south side of Chicago that is a very famous study um, in relation to um, socioeconomic status and drinking. But one of the things that we um, kind of uncovered with this and that was a through line was when we talk about socioeconomic status and, um, and race, right? We're talking about, um, he, he says it in his interview, Dr. Norris says, you know, uh, when we only look at certain communities, we're doing ourselves a disservice towards FASD because this affects everybody. And it is very true and something that needs to be taken a look at, which is, you know, it's not just um, people of different races in urban areas or of lower economic status that are drinking and this is happening to. This is happening to white, educated um people in living in upper class societies and they feel for some reason we don't know why yet i mean we've sat around and um you know tried to hypothesize as to why this is happening but you know that they are like that it doesn't affect them right um and then and it does it affects everybody right so this is and and everybody has access to the alcohol some communities have more access to alcohol. And that's something that we talked about with Dr. Norris, right? You get into the South side of Chicago, there's not a Whole Foods around every corner where you can go get proper nutrition and things like that or have access to it. Instead, there's a liquor store, right? So, um, you know, and yet the numbers are still equivalent. They're still the same for upper class, you know, privileged um, people and versus uh, urban communities where this is the only thing thrust in front of their faces, right? And so, um, again, it comes back to our greater relationship with alcohol as well. Um, it's not a race issue. FASD is a human issue. It is. It affects every single race, no matter what color, every single economic status, no matter if you're rich or poor. Anybody can be can affect their baby with alcohol if they drink while they're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so when we're only looking something that was talked about in relation to, to, to Dr. Bell's study was, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice when you're only looking in these communities. So we have to peel back the layer and say, you know what, educated college, educated white women that have all the money in the world are still drinking and, and during pregnancy, you know, medical doctors across all communities are still telling, women that it's okay to have a glass of wine if they're stressed when it's been proven scientifically for almost 50 years now that there is no safe amount you know and so um it's it's one of those things that you know i think that everybody needs to understand and it's so important that people understand this that this impacts us all and it is a through line through the film um it's i think in our public service announcement it's it's a through line. It's our pretty much our opening line. It impacts everybody. It is not limited uh, to one community over another. Um, right. And so one thing that I had not thought of or been trained on really in this perspective that I learned through watching some of the footage that they gathered and Dr. Lorenzo Norris, not I, I hope I do a good job paraphrasing what I had watched from this interview, but you know, the idea that if you just look at the history of FASD research, the original studies were done in communities that were pre- predominantly Native American or predominantly African American um, in in our country and in other countries. And it, it's that history, just because they went there expecting to see it maybe at a higher mm-hmm. prevalence mm-hmm. because of lack of resources and mm-hmm. high access to alcohol. And honestly, alcohol is like this Band-Aid to cope with the symptom- symptoms sure. that come with, a, you know, historical displacement and oppression. But, um, you know, you know, to stay on that theme, the idea that the history of where the studies first were done somehow like gets locked in our brain. And we just assume that that's a problem that lives with these communities. Mm-hmm. And then here, you know, Christian in my lab, I mean, we have a grant that we look, we go to Cape Town, South Africa, and not just Cape Town, we go to a specific area referred to as a collection of communities referred to the flats. 
well, there's a long history of race-based oppression, almost like uh, the DOP system where they got paid in wine to work on vineyards that, you know, belonged to many of their ancestors, but was stolen away from them from, you know, over the, the generations. And we go there because it's considered the global hub for, for FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, because there's a high proportion of maternal alcohol consumption. However, you know, when you actually go over there and you peel it back, well, why are they drinking? It's like, we're just like saying that the women are drinking, therefore they're this global hub of FAS. Well, but they're drinking because they're, you know, a couple generations ago, I mean, they were just paid in alcohol. I mean, they're, this isn't an individual choice. It can't be about the mom's decision anymore. This is a community societal wide issue that we need to look at as a whole society. And so when you look at it and you label it as an issue of displaced communities or a, a historically oppressed communities or presently oppressed communities, and you label FASD as being a problem of them because they're drinking, that is, that is problematic perspective. That's problematic messaging. That's a problematic way to phrase it. What's really happening is like, well, why are they drinking? Well, because they may be uh, of that racism <laughs> and, and all of these things. So it's not a problem of those communities. It's our wider societal problem because there's some kind of level of systemic racism going on that I think is causing problems and alcohol and substance use is kind of like a band aid mm -hmm. that, that, that is being used. The irony that Justin and I have been on a personal journey to get a little personal is that, you know, we're drinkers. Like when he was off doing this and I was, you know, solo parenting, I mean, I was having a glass of wine here and there and we just were like, what? we are hypocrites. Why are we even drinking? Like it just really threw our relationship with alcohol up in the mirror super fast. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, we realized how insidious it is and people don't want to give it up. But when you have problems, whether it's, uh, you know, mental health challenges, whether it's financial ability to pay your bills or medical access, all of these things, and you feel, you know, alcohol industry and media and all of this marketing makes you feel like having a drink will kind of, help numb, numb it or make it a little easier or make enhance the fun of a night. But the reality is when you wake up the next day, you in, if you do that enough over and over and over again, I mean, really alcohol is kind of just putting, you know, fuel on a fire that you're trying to cope with. So alcohol is just becoming part of the feedback loop of the problems that you're experiencing. It's like this coping mechanism that is really just actually making the thing you're coping with even bigger problem in your life. So we are just realizing like, why are we even drinking? So, I mean, we totally just like stopped <laughs> because, and we feel great, but it's, it's, we started off being like, this is an anti, anti-alcohol film. This is about no alcohol in pregnancy. And it's still that, but for us personally, we're kind of like, like, where is the space for alcohol in our own life? And why does it feel like such a big sacrifice to give it up? And it really, it's about society holding a mirror up and this isn't just a problem of the mom drinking. Why is she drinking? Because if she was able to not drink, then she would have the education. She would have the ability and the support to do so. So none of that is her. Why are we putting on the individual? And then that stigma is why this is more prevalent than autism, down syndrome and spina bifida combined. Yet it's the only one preventable, the only developmental disorder that's preventable. So why aren't we preventing it? stigma like none of us want to face this and dr norris touches on this too and it's it's our relationship with pain right i mean you know if you really dissect it down um even if you're drinking out socially maybe it's because you have a little social anxiety and you feel like you need to be uninhibited right and that's all again ties back kind of to pain it's like you know you have a small hole you're in a boat you have a small hole in the boat and drinking alcohol is just taking a bucket and throwing the water out. Right. And like, that's just, but the water still keeps coming in. So you got to take a look at that hole. You got to find it and plug it up, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and then again, something Christina just touched on, which is this being an anti alcohol thing. I mean, the reality is, you know, it's really intrinsically tied into our, our society globally and just humanity. Right. So, um, I mean, you look back at, you know, um, the, the Greeks and the Romans and stuff. I mean, it's all there, you know, um, and so and it always has been. So um, when are we going to take a look? I interviewed um, Dr. Suzanne Rich and 
you know, she she drew a parallel between Brave New World by Aldous Huxley mm -hmm. and kind of our modern day relationship with alcohol and mm -hmm. how it's, you know, we're spending so much money on it, how it keeps us kind of numbed and mm -hmm. not talking about things. Right. And and like, you know, um, we think we're, you know, uninhibited and, you know, like we convince ourselves that like, oh, I'm more loose or I'm more this or I'm more that. And as a comic, I can tell you, you know what I mean? A lot of comics you know you're on the road you're you, you know it's 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 a thing it's a hard thing to avoid you're performing right? in bars yeah you're performing in bars yeah. you're hanging out with people whom you don't know that are drinking at your you know what i'm saying like so you know you've seen a lot of comedians pass because of their you know substance abuse disorders and stuff mm -hmm. but um but this is just it all ties into like it's not anti-alcohol but i do think that a big part of it is people kind of waking up and taking a look at like what, why am I drinking? And should we have beer and champagne and mimosas at a baby shower? We're celebrating a life coming into the world. The one person that we're celebrating, the one or two people that we're celebrating can't consume this, but we're all going to, and then we're going to blow something up and start a wildfire because we want to know if it's a boy or a girl, you know, like, I don't know, like it, the things have just kind of gotten out of hand. And again, I want to reiterate this and make sure, cause it will be in the film for sure. This is not only on the mom to not drink. If a woman goes out with her friends and doesn't have a drink, her friends will say, well, what are you pregnant? Mm -hmm. You know, like as if that's a bad thing, like, no, I'm just choosing not to drink. But if you are pregnant, your hut, I want to reiterate what Christina said. You as a husband, father, family, everybody around should abstain from alcohol so that that mom does not feel isolated in this, in this ne complete necessity to have an alcohol free environment mm -hmm. um and um i think that it's just really important that we can all do our part you know and this is again a message in the film we can all do our part by helping create the next generation of you know of alcohol free like loved kids that are they're up against some big problems so we don't need to add to their problems we need to take away and give them the best opportunity to solve these big problems by removing this very preventable disorder, right? So, um, you know, and it's gonna take all of us mm -hmm. and we're all gonna have to take a look at our relationship with it. So it's a, it's a big tall order <laughs> in this film, but you know, we're, we're hoping we can, we can tackle that and get that out there. Well, one thing that comes to mind after you both said your statement was going back to um, I believe it was in our previous interview, Christina, um, right around the end, you noticed or came to a realization, hey, I'm this researcher who comes from a privileged area, mm -hmm. um, who's white, um, mm -hmm. and has these means and resources to go inside of this impoverished environment and sort of benefit off of it too. Yeah. Um, but then you later found out, okay, well, I can slowly but surely find ways in order to combat this and maybe even make a table for the people that are affected by this, whether it's related to race or related to certain disorders exactly. or even um, social economic status. Um, so with this film now, and maybe you can even refer off to maybe the interviewees that you engaged with and things like that, mm -hmm. how as... I believe it was, it's, it's between all of you guys, um, how, when you engage with people who were, you know, affected by this, or maybe are, um, have a lower social st economic status as you or a different race, how do you see yourself, you know, playing this role and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do in order to help bring awareness, not only towards the condition, but also saying that it's affecting these groups of people because of outside stressors mm -hmm. due to systemic racism or oppression. Yep. So uh, through the film, do you want to answer that? The, the, the metaphor that for, so how you viewed yourself making the film. Is yeah, that which, yeah. Is, which is just, again, it impacts everybody. And the voice of this community has long been there mm -hmm. and um, we're not giving them a voice. We're, we're building a megaphone for them to yell at the top of their lungs. Mm -hmm. Look at us, pay attention to this. Let's look at this from every angle. 
every corner, every race, every socioeconomic status. Let's look at all of this together. This is a humanity issue. This is not just tied down to one thing, this, that, or the other. This is, again, this is all of us. And again, it's pro it's global, right? We're only we're only going from the American side of this because we're we're behind other countries. Australia's doing a great job. Um, Canada's long been working at, at this, and um, and we need to we need to catch up and we need to get ahead of the curve on all of this. But but you know, like I said, we're we're building a megaphone so that um, this voice can be amplified mm -hmm. and be heard and seen and take this from being the invisible disorder to the a, a common thing just like everybody knows what autism is now i mean most people know what it is or they've heard it or spoken about it or seen it in the news you know and that was because the parents of that community got fed up of being overlooked and not understanding what was happening and not having resources when they did understand what was happening and uh and they got up and yelled until people listened and so we're par just part of that right now that's happening so um you know that's i guess as best as i can yeah for the film is that megaphone um has been the guiding mm -hmm. kind of framework in my research i mean i think that it depends how you view yourself as a scientist and i i don't know that this would apply to every single scientist out there but certainly the you know we're trained to kind of you know try to go out and actually in a way be the judge of what's an issue what needs the attention you know, write it up in a grant, in a package, convince the funders, you know, like this is a problem, this needs funding. And in a way we have a very large, powerful role in what gets attention. And we are filtering it through our own perspective. And I think, you know, landing in public health as a neuroscientist has really changed my view that I view myself more as someone who's, you know, more has like, I, I have power as a scientist so that like, um, that I view myself more as a public servant. So rather than just investigating things that I think are important through my my uh, white Caucasian, uh, pr more financially privileged lens as an American, you know, um, that I actually view myself more as like, if you're a public servant, what's a good elected political figure do? They go around and talk to like everybody. What does, you know, a good leader of a community, you know, do? They, they listen to their community and then they try to fulfill the community's needs. So I'm just trying to connect more with people who do community-based research, more focus groups with people to, you know, before I go write a grant, well, what does the community need? How can I use my scientific training and tools to, you know, be a, a, a public servant and just ask the questions that people want asked um, and try to answer them and give them stuff that they want and not really put myself in that seat as the judge of what, where my attention and resources should be directed if that makes sense. So that's what I have learned and going into a community and doing research where, you know, um, I, I, I'm not even a national citizen <laughs> and I just get to go publish and get more, you know, grants and, and more pats on the back. It just, if it's quite alarming when you start to see it like that, when you're leaving after five years and, and that community doesn't really benefit from anything except for perpetuating the label that they're the global hub for FASD. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so also the words you use in your publications, I think I, I really pivoting with trying to do a better job with that and just doing the studies that, that people want to be done so that I'm mm -hmm. not gatekeeping them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I feel like that it is definitely a, like a learning experience um, for both sides, both as a scientist and as a filmmaker. Like me and Matthew were actually talking about it uh, not too long ago. He just made a documentary about um, the Japanese internment camps. And as he oh, cool. was, you know, interviewing people and people that actually went through this or it's affected them um, directly because of where their family is from um since he can't directly relate from it he was wondering well who am i you know to yeah. to to voice this mm -hmm. uh and matt you can even expand on this more um cuz it's it's really a battle right yeah i mean finding finding that connection right you don't want to just go and say i want to do this documentary about this topic because it's important you know because mm -hmm. you miss that connection aspect and this is this is only the second 
documentary I, I really worked on. The first one I did um, about space, which was very different from doing something about the Japanese American internment camps. Um, and uh, I did like, I did, you know, I guess research is like doing the proper research is important. And like you said, meeting, meeting the community and hearing what they have to say and learning from them. So like here in Los Angeles, I would go to little Tokyo. They would always host events. Um, they were talking about the uh, immigration camps going on right now along the border and how families are being separated. And that's when I realized like that story was no longer about the Jap it, like that that story I was telling isn't about the Japanese American internment camps. It's about what's going on today through the lens of what happened in the past. And once I realized that, everything kind of clicked. Um, and and that's when I started understanding that it's about today, you know. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Yeah. So how do it, we view this, Matthew? Huh? How do we view, how do we view this documentary? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean, I from from the sound of it, it sounds like you're you're already doing it. You know, you're you're talking to the people that are directly affected. You know, and I think that's the most important part. Um, and, we know uh, how do we view your. Oh no, your documentary, man. Oh, I thought you meant like in like how do you view? Okay, I see what you mean. Oh, it's it's private. I'll send it to you. It was going through some film festivals, but it's actually almost done going through like its film festival route. So I'll send you a private link to it um it's, it's only 10 minutes long yeah so that was interesting and it was a little bit experimental because there's a film uh i'm gonna go off tangent here but <laughs> called night in fog it's a french film and it's about the holocaust mm -hmm. and it was it was inter what's interesting is because it was it was created during the the french government asked this specific director I, I forgot his name um i don't know how to pronounce it but it was uh they asked him to make this documentary about the Holocaust, like about 10 years after the Holocaust happened. But at that same time, they asked him to make this film about the Holocaust. The French was doing the same atrocity to Algeria. Hmm. They were, they were, they were also, they were committing the same crimes against Algeria as the Germans were to Jewish people. And it, it was ironic that they were asking this director to make a film about the Holocaust. So what he did, because his previous films got banned before, was he he made it about Algeria without saying it. So he made it about the Holocaust, but what it really was was about that that time in France. So that's kind of also like an angle I came at it. It was very similar. So I kind of experimented with it a bit and, and tried to try to create a similar uh, feel. So wow. Yeah. I love that idea of using history to look at where you're, you know, what's going on today through that historical lens. I mean, obviously that's, that's very powerful. Um, I, I love that. And it's, it's interesting to me is like, you know, the parallels between the Holocaust and uh, the um, American Japanese uh, mm -hmm. uh, imprisonment camps. And then even like going back to FASD, it's just like, you know, the, the, the range of destructive human behavior that still, you know, that we're capable of, yeah. you know, like harming a baby, you know, and maybe not even having control of yourself. It's like, you know, your situation, like, does that all that you feel like you can do in that moment just to get by in that day? Right. I mm -hmm. mean, and, and all of these things have these long lasting impacts on us and they're so dark and yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, from going back to something we were just touching on, which is, you know, um, I didn't grow up privileged myself, but, you know, like viewing, there used to be such a different correlation between race and privilege. And nowadays, um, you know, class and socioeconomic status and, you know, privilege are really kind of separating on their own courses. Right. And so, when you're talking about scientifically or from a filmmaker standpoint, like I always kind of view it as, you know, if you, an analogy or a metaphor, if you will, if, if we were, you know, rock climbing, you may be up, up higher up than someone, but that's where, you know, like maybe you started there and you're not able to go back down because you're, everybody's trying to get to the top of this mountain, but you can, you can go down like belay for someone down below and help pull up right and so i think that we need to get out of our own 
you know, our own environment, pull the lens back. If that, if I guess if that makes sense from a film perspective, get off your close up and go to a move to a wide shot. You know what I mean? And start looking around you at your environment. And I think that that's what's happening and you're seeing it in, in science, you're seeing it in filmmaking. And I think a lot of veils are being lifted and it's, it's a rough go, but it's also what's needed right now. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of turmoil ha happening right now. And, um, um, I think that, you know, again, these topics and, and just the ability to breach them properly and try and do service to the topic itself is the most important thing. Right. So, um, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. going back to talking about the privilege aspect of things. Yeah. That you're not, imp you're not filtering anything, right? Like exactly. you're just, yeah, you're you're using whatever tools you have and power you have at that moment to just build that megaphone and trying to just spread that around yeah. rather than picking and choosing who you're going to kind of, you know, take a, own, take a photo of for your own benefit. and then put yeah. it out there and then get all the credit for taking that photo. <laughs> so right. it's, oh, man. Yep. yeah. And even the rock climbing analogy, it's really, it's like, well, but maybe, you know, if, depending on what you look like and what resources you were born into, particularly in our country. I mean, it's just, it's like, I feel like I've been climbing, you know, my hill that I'm climbing is just like this gentle hill with these obvious grab holes. Right. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, well, why don't you just grab these? Why don't you just keep grabbing things? And then maybe mm -hmm. someone's climbing a steep face where someone's actively like having, yeah. you know, bad weather and nowhere to grab. And all these things against them. And every day is just trying to stay even put, you know, really. And it's just not, we're not even climbing the same mountain. Mm -hmm. yep. That's I, right. I just, you, you remind me, I just actually learned like two weeks ago um, of uh, this photographer, Lang. I forgot her first name. She's a famous photographer. Uh, there's this a famous uh, Great Depression photo of a woman. It's in black and white. It's of a woman oh, yeah. and her children. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly. That famous photo. So yeah. apparently she never got paid for that. So and she didn't want to be the face of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So this this Nat this mm -hmm. Nat Geo photographer, um, or was she she might have been hired by the government. I can't remember exactly, but she went out and, and took these photos and then she took a photo of a stranger and she that face became the face of the Great Depression and she didn't get any support from it. She didn't want to be a part of, of that photo. And um, wow. so, you know, I, I think having that ethical mindset is important because that if, if you're not if you if you're not considering people like the, the people you're talking to when you're filming them or taking photos of them, then like, what's the point of what you're doing? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. asking yourself why Yeah, you got to know the why and 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 the who, you know what I mean, is very is very important. And um you know, is it, is it benefiting you or is it benefiting again, the cause or the topic? Right. So, um, that's, again, that's a, you know, I kind of meant by that analogy, which is just like, you know, be, be helpful to, uh, with it. we're, we're at a time right now where we need to come together more than ever. You know, we've never been probably more divided as, as a country mm -hmm. and, um, like, you know, and not, not talking about that doesn't make it go away. You know what I'm saying? Like, so um, I think that it's important that people talk about it, address it and, and, you know, take a look at why. And again, make it, we were talking about this last night, you know, in our, our country right now, we're, we're kind of bred on individualism, right? It's like, you know, we're all taught where that it's, it's all about us as an individual. Right. And then some other countries are bred on collectivism and it's more about the country. Right. You know, um, and both, if you go far, too far down either side of that spectrum, it's going to lead to decay <laughs> societally. So, um, you know, again, I think it's talking about community and these are, these are things that the film and FASD, it's all tied into. Um, and it's very important that um, we get that message out too, you know, um, something, something that we learned along the way, you know, and we're learning along the way in science research and uh, and filmmaking and every other thing. It's kind of funny the the through lines and the parallels between the, between them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Can I also give a shout out to to literally the 43 people that risked COVID to show up and unmask for this? Yeah. And it was experts, people with FASD, caregivers, parents, you know, it was everyone, site coordinators, um, not included that that head count. And then all of the, the grassroots movement has been led by our, all of our co-producers. So Gigi Davidson, Teresa Conboy, uh, Jennifer Wisdall, and uh, Lindsay and Spencer Munns. And I said, yeah, oh, I yeah. think I got yes. her yes, and, exactly. and, you know, just booking everything. And it, I mean, this has really been this huge group effort to really make this happen. And the grassroots energy is really magical to be part of is, mm-hmm. you know, t- getting away from ownership over something or control over something, but like, you know, just sharing in all of this and that synergy when it actually happens and you have that level of trust where you can, I'll lean on each other like that is mm-hmm. is magical. Yeah, it is. Most definitely. Well, we've definitely hit our hour mark, but I did have one critical question for the both of you. Um, now that everything's all set up and that you've done the film, what's next? When it comes well, to, to post production. Yeah, so we are as you know, like I said before, we're 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 still trying to raise funds to, and and get help. We need help with visual effects and um, graphics stuff. Um, but other than that, we are again just we have our eye on getting this awareness video out as soon as possible. Just getting the awareness out there, mm-hmm. getting it a PSA done, and maybe even the video done before this legis- article of legislation hits our politicians yet again, so it doesn't get turned down this time. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be a huge win. Um, and then eyes towards, you know, making a docuseries and really, really going in depth on all of the topics related to FASD, the economics, the SES, the prison, you know, the stuff that we were talking about before. Um, all of there, there's just each one of these, and we realized this a while back after um, introducing, uh, interviewing uh, Tim and Teresa Conboy, hey, you know, this isn't just a documentary. This is an hour-long series, uh, you know, an hour-long episode in a series per topic on FASD. It's just, it's that big. And so we're really, you know, aiming our eyes towards that as our kind of super objective and our, our main goal. Um for make it better and and we're not gonna stop until we we are at the table talking about that and i think the really important thing too is that um because of the lack of good diagnostic systems in place because of the lack of understanding people with fasd and parents of of individuals with fasd are left to basically educate everyone their Mm -hmm. kids school teacher pediatrician you know social worker whatever Mm -hmm. Everyone they come in contact, their family members, their friends, and because of the nature of this developmental disorder, you know, they feel very isolated. And so in some ways, you know, by having the film as the megaphone, it's really allowing them, their stories to be told, validated, heard, and so that they don't have to constantly... be at you know going in the emergency room and educating every single healthcare provider that they meet at the door maybe they could just deal with parenting a child with a pervasive developmental disability or living with a pervasive de- developmental disability at that point right. Right. and not also have to like be the major educator yeah. again to draw another parallel to black lives matter because we're learning so much about what's effective because it's been so you know hugely effective is is that you know it's not up to the very p- people who are being oppressed or who are struggling to then educate everybody. It's the people who are part of and benefiting from the systems that are oppressive, right? That to educate themselves and then others like them. And that's the ma- that's why it's relevant to all of us, even if you're not currently being oppressed or under-resourced. And so with FASD, I mean, the, the, the parallel that we're learning from BLM to be effective in this FASD awareness movement is, you know, we want to, since we don't have, you know, we're not parenting children with FASD and dealing with this day in day out struggle of educating everyone. Maybe we could play a role in, you know, giving like helping educate other people. Right. Mm -hmm. So that it takes some of that burden off the people who are living with this developmental disability who never asked for it or the parents who are parenting kids with this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can help with that part of it just to 
make something easier and prevent it <laughs> from future generations would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Build that megaphone. Yeah. Yeah. Man, yep. I love that analogy. Yeah, Not we've, been, we've voice, definitely been, yeah. I, the BLM movement has definitely been quite a nice, um, you know, example of what's working mm-hmm. and, and definitely been able to draw some analogies here to mm-hmm. learn from it. Mm-hmm. Well, All thank right. you so well, much for joining us. Yeah. We, thank you guys so much. Yeah. yeah thank you. We, we love talking about your work and we love talking about film since we're filmmakers ourselves. So mm-hmm. yeah. we'll definitely be calling upon you guys yeah. in the future. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. And then even because I said, oh, that sounds like us. When you're all like, oh, graphics, yeah. things like that and blah, blah, blah. Because <laughs> um, I draw all the graphics for the show. So I was <laughs> like, oh. Well, maybe I can, maybe I can help out or anything like that. It just depends. So, yeah, we're all we're all family here. We're all trying to make a difference. We're all trying to uh, approach this massive, massive problem um, through different lenses. But we're all trying to get the same result. So, I yeah, we would definitely love to help any way that we can. Thank you so much. And if anyone's interested in following, you can go to www.thefasdproject.org or .com. They both take you there. The tea is hot this morning. Thank you so much for listening, y'all. It's always a pleasure to revisit previous interviewees. Next week, we'll be doing LWL and we'll be covering the origin of gangs in Los Angeles. Now that is a story to tell. Now I know Petty interrupted me last episode <laughs> when she had news about Bruce's beach, but that, that was a story that needed to be told and needed to be told and needed to be spread it. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to cover uh, the origin of gangs this upcoming week. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. Matt, did you have anything else to say? I thought what was interesting was uh that Bruce's Beach episode was uh, actually written it was the first episode you wrote for LWL like I don't know, almost yeah, 10 weeks yeah. ago now. And yeah, uh like it then was, then yeah. it was all over the news this last week and, and yeah. Christian <laughs> Christian was like, Oh, okay, now we have to now we have to record this episode because of what's going on. <laughs> It was so, just like a little pilot episode, like a little little proposal script. And I was like, nah, like, I'm not sure if we should cover this one yet. Like, I need to learn more about it. Then it was just like everywhere, all over KTLA. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, <laughs> I guess we got to say something now. <laughs> yep. Also, don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you like the show. We heard that it helps get the word out. And we would love for as many people to hear about osm and listen to what our guests have to say as possible and also don't forget to follow the fasdproject.org that's the t-h-e f-a-s-d project.org thanks for listening and we'll see you next time all right and we'll see you next time and one last thing i see oh. y'all in my dms <laughs> and it's like the osm dms saying stuff leave us a voice message y'all so we can go ahead and present it for the next episode y'all we want to hear from you all right thank you so much for listening we'll see y'all next week see you next time